it's such a compelling notion to me that we're now working on all these exciting machine learning systems that are able to learn, you know, uh, from, from data. And then if we can have this other brain that's a learning system that's live wired in when, on the human side and them to be able to communicate, it's like a, a self play mechanism was able to beat the game, the, the world champion at Go. So they can play with each other, the computer and the brain, uh, like when you sleep. I mean, there's a lot of futuristic kind of things that it's just um, exciting possibilities. But I hear you. We understand so little about the actual intricacies of the communication of the brain that it's hard to find the common language. Well, interestingly, the technologies that have been built don't actually require the perfect common language. So for example, hundreds of thousands of people are walking around with artificial ears and artificial eyes, meaning cochlear implants or retinal implants. So this is, you know, you take a essentially digital microphone, you slip an electrode strip into the inner ear and people can learn how to hear that way. Or you take an electrode grid and you plug it into the retina at the back of the eye and people can learn how to see that way. The interesting part is those devices don't, speak exactly the natural biological language. They speak the dialect of Silicon Valley. And, and it turns out that as, yeah. as recently as about 25 years ago, a lot of people thought this was never going to work. They thought it, was, it wasn't going to work for that reason, but the brain figures it out. It's really good at saying, okay, look, there's some correlation between what I can touch and feel and hear and, and so on and the data that's coming in or between, you know, I clap my hands and I, and I have signals coming in there and it figures out how to speak any language. Oh, that's fascinating. So, like, uh, no matter so your, no matter if it's Neuralink, uh, so directly communicating with the brain, or it's a smartphone, or Google Glass, or the brain figures out the efficient way of communication. Well, exactly, exactly. And what I propose is, is the potato head theory of evolution, which is which is um, that all you know, our eyes and nose and mouth and ears and fingertips, all this stuff is just plug and play. Yeah. And the brain can figure out what to do with the data that comes in. And, and part of the reason that I think this is right, and I care so deeply about this, is when you look across the animal kingdom, you find all kinds of weird peripheral devices plugged in, and the brain figures out what to do with the data. And I don't believe that Mother Nature has to reinvent the um, principles of brain operation each time to say, oh, now I'm going to have heat pits to detect infrared. Now I'm going to have something to detect, uh, you know, electroreceptors on the body. Now I'm going to detect something to pick up the magnetic field of the earth with cryptochromes in the eye and so on. Instead, the brain says, oh, I got it. There's data coming in. Is that useful? Can I do something with it? Oh, great. I'm going to mold myself around the data that's coming in. It's, it's kind of fascinating to think that we think of smartphones and all this new technology as novel. It's totally novel as outside of what evolution ever intended or like what nature ever intended. It's fascinating to think that like the entirety of the process of evolution is perfectly fine and ready for the smartphone oh, yeah. and the internet. Like it's ready. It's ready to be malleable to that and whatever comes to, to cyborgs, to virtual reality. We kind of think like this is, you know, there's all these like books written about natural, what's natural and we're like destroying our natural selves by like embracing all this technology. It's kind of, it's, you know, we're not probably not giving the brain enough credit. Like yeah. this, th this, this thing, this thing is just fine with new tech. Oh, exactly. It, it yeah. wraps itself around. And by the way, wait till you have kids. You'll see the ease with which they pick up on stuff. And <laughs> yeah, as Kevin yeah. Kelly said, um, technology is what gets invented after you're born. <laughs> but the yeah. stuff that already exists when you're born, that's not even tech. That's just background furniture. Like yeah. the fact that the iPad exists for my son and daughter, like that's just background yeah. furniture. So um, yeah, it's um, because we have this incredibly malleable system, it just absorbs whatever is going on in the world and learns what to do with it. So do you think, just to linger for, for a little bit more, do you think it's possible to co-adjust? Like we're kind of... Uh, you know, for the machine to adjust to the brain, for the brain to adjust to the machine. I guess that's what's already happening. Sure, that is what's happening. So for example, when, when you put electrodes in the motor cortex to control a robotic arm for somebody who's paralyzed, the engineers do a lot of work to figure out, okay, what can we do with the algorithm here so that we can detect what's going on from these cells and figure out how to best 
program the robotic arm to move given the data that we're measuring from these cells. But also the brain is learning too. So, you know, the paralyzed woman says, wait, I'm trying to grab this thing. And by the way, it's all about relevance. So if there's a piece of food there and she's hungry, she'll figure out how to get this food into her mouth with the robotic arm because that is what matters.